So you guys didn't have as many questions this month as you did last month. Thought that was interesting. Maybe, maybe that's because we're moving into some more familiar territory in the book of Genesis. In fact, if you grew up going to Bible class, raise your hand. How many of you grew up to go to Bible class as a little kid? Yeah, see, if you grew up going to Bible class, the story of Abraham is probably not an unfamiliar story, right? From a little kid over and over again, you learned about those, those, those uh, stories we read about in these early chapters of Genesis. But I want to remind you about something tonight. These aren't just stories. And what we're reading about right now in Genesis, Max, is not just a biography of Abraham, but instead a very select collection of incidents or episodes from his life that have been chosen for a very special purpose. Well, that's right, David. We, we actually have some markers. We know uh, what happened when Abraham is 75. We see him at 86, at 99, and 100. But you've got a total there in just in that span of 25 years, and yet you have only three or four markers in that time. And so we ask our question, why? Why these incidents are given, recorded for us? Now, why does the Spirit choose the material He does? And that's a very important question to ask yourself as you're doing the Genesis read. You're all keeping up, right? Headed into Genesis 19 this week. Uh, when you're reading these stories, ask yourself, okay, so why did He pick this episode? Why is this story in here? And, and I will tell you, the answer will lie in the bigger redemption story. Because remember, that's what the Bible is. It's the story of redemption. Abraham is only here because he has a role to play in the redemption stories. And the stories we're told about him are stories that, well, that contribute to God telling us about redemption. So, I want you to notice uh, about four things in the, the chapters we're going to look at tonight that I think are especially significant. Did you notice in your reading the reference to the promises? Remember the promises in Genesis chapter 12, I will make of you a great nation, I'm going to give your people this land, and in you all families of the earth be blessed, right? Those promises keep coming up, don't they? Not only do they come up, Max, but we expound on them and we learn more about the promises. So, the promises come up. Second thing that comes up, and boy, this is all in the reading this for the last month, child drama, right? All this drama about Abraham and Sarah having a child. It's critical. Yeah, it, it's critical because God has said, Abraham, through you is going to come this great nation. Well, you can't have a nation if Abraham has no children. Exactly. And so, over and over again, the reason the child is coming up is because of the promise on which this child uh, is absolute, or that makes this child absolutely necessary. The other thing that I want you to watch for, and we'll see this as we continue through Genesis and through this story, is the blessing and curse promise from Genesis 12. Do y'all remember that? Because it doesn't make our top three, and by the way, we talk about the three promises to Abraham in Genesis 12. There are more than three. There's about six. And one of the promises is, I will bless those who bless you. Do you remember that? And the one who curses you, I will curse. Watch for that in the stories, because what you find out is when you are good to the family, that sounds kind of like a mafia thing, that's not how I intended. <laughs> but when you're good to the family, things go well for you. But when you mess with the family, things do not go well for you. And that actually, Max, works its way out in the reading over the last month. And, and if we watch as we go through the book of Genesis, we'll see that long after Abraham is dead, we see the blessing and cursing idea still continuing. Yeah, absolutely. And then the fourth thing I want you to watch for as we go through the chapters tonight is what we learn about Abraham's faith. I don't know uh, that I would identify that as one of the key threads running through here, but, but, you know, Hebrews celebrates the faith of Abraham. And so, we think of him as being a man of great faith, and he certainly was. But what we find out when we read Genesis is that's not the whole story, is it? There is more to the story of Abraham's faith, and I think some really great lessons for me and you along well, the way. Well, I, I would just say this, David, that uh, Abraham gives hope to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's because, exactly right. You know, uh, 
I'm not the only person in this room whose faith is up here and then sometimes not up here, okay? And that's where Abraham was too. But in the big picture, this is the man who trusted God. Well, and that's the key is that you hang in there even when your faith has faltered and you've failed. You hang in there and you keep serving God and, and, and you know, he rebounds. He comes back, doesn't he? It, we do not give up. We don't that's give the up. point. Abraham never gave up. All right. You know where we're starting tonight? Where are we going to start? Ooh, they don't know. Genesis 14. I should have said that at the beginning. So head over to Genesis 14. That's, uh, that's where we're picking up from our last, last text talk. And Genesis 14, we have five chapters don't cover, don't we? I don't have any idea how we're going to do that. How long y'all want to stay tonight? Um, Genesis 14 is actually interesting because for the first time, we have a, a, uh, an incident from world history sort of intersecting Bible history. We have this big battle that takes place. Evidently, uh, Ketelaomer was a pretty powerful ruler, sort of controlled that region where Abraham is. And, and some of the kings in that area rebel against him, uh, including uh, Barah, king, uh, king of Sodom. That's especially important here. And so uh, Ketelaomer gathers up his allies, and he comes pouring into the land, and he puts down this rebellion. And uh, in the aftermath, he takes the spoils of war, right? Property and people. people. Remember that in your reading? The only reason this story is important and recorded is because what did he do in the process? He messed with the family, didn't he? And that's going to be a problem for him. Verse 12 tells us, they also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possession, and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So they messed with the family. Question, how's that going to go for them? Yeah, not good, because you're not supposed to mess with the family if you curse them, God's going to curse you. So Abraham, Abraham gets a, a small army together and he goes and he, uh, he runs down Ketelaomer and defeats him. And he, um, he brings back uh, the people and the possessions and most importantly, his nephew, Lot. And if you look at verse 17, that's where all of this gets really interesting because they meet up with two kings one of them is expected, Max. It's Barah, king of Sodom. He shows up because Abraham has his stuff. But the other king that shows up is Melchizedek, king of Salem. And now he's a really interesting Bible character. Well, he is. And there's so much to say about this story. But as you pointed out correctly, this, this story is in here because of Lot being kidnapped. Yes. And so Abraham is going to go after him. And Abraham has a small army, 318 men who are trained to fight. That tells you something about how wealthy God had already made Abraham. The fact that he's got uh, a small army of 318 men who can go and, and uh, do what they did in this case. But the story of Melchizedek is really interesting. Uh, he appears initially as sort of a minor character. It's kind of an, oh, by the way, there was this mm -hmm. other king, right. and he comes out to meet Abraham, and uh, he blesses Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils that he has taken in the war. But Melchizedek is critically important to the Bible story because much, much later, a couple thousand years later, the, the writer of Hebrews is going to use Melchizedek for a couple of purposes. One, to say that Jesus is like Melchizedek, both king and priest, no one before him in his lineage, no one after him who was both king and priest. And also to show the superiority of the priesthood of Christ uh, over that of the priesthood of Levi. The priesthood of Levi is actually in the loins of Abraham, so to speak, the Hebrew writer says. And, and yet Abraham paid tithes to this man, showing the inferiority of what was yet in Abraham's loins, the inferiority of Levi to Melchizedek. It's kind of a complicated thing, but Hebrews 7, 8, and 9, it's a really, really big deal. Also, here we're introduced to Melchizedek, king of Salem. Yes. And Salem is right. an ancient name for the city of Jerusalem. Yep. And there were some people there called the Jebusites who lived there. Jebusalem, 
Jerusalem, and so that was just kind of an evolution over a period of the next thousand years. It came to be Jerusalem, but well, this is the city. Even in this context, though, there's an interesting contrast between these two kings. Yeah. Uh, you know, Melchizedek is obviously a good guy. He comes out and he brings bread and wine uh, for Abraham, and he pronounces a blessing on him and acknowledges God is the source of his victory. So in every way, Melchizedek comes off like this good guy. And by contrast, Barak comes out and he starts making demands as though he has a right to uh, about uh, how Abraham needs to distribute all these things that he has brought back. And, and at that time, if he'd wanted to, had every right to hang on to them and keep them. And, and, and so, you have an interesting contrast between the two kings, but what's more interesting is Abraham's response to the two kings. Uh, Melchizedek, he actually pays a tie to and, and embraces him, but he wants nothing to do with the king of Sodom. That's right. In fact, what he says is, I don't want any of your stuff. Did you guys read that? Look down at verse 23. He said, I don't want any of your stuff so that you will never say, I have made Abraham rich. The king of Sodom, Abraham says, I want nothing to do with you. I don't want you to ever say you made me rich. I thought about that because it contrasts with another character, and that is Abraham's own nephew. Remember, why did Lot move next to Sodom and then into Sodom? because it was an opportunity to be enriched. And by contrast, Abraham, I think, sees the evil here, and he says, I don't want anything to do with them. And, and it's apparent, it's implied in this case, that Abraham has got a right to keep this stuff. Yes. And, but he doesn't want to keep it because he says, look, God's going to take care of me. I'm not going to take your stuff because I'm not going to have you go around saying, hey, I'm the one who made Abraham rich. It was God who made who made Abraham rich. You know, that there's something else to note here. In this case, and then our reading this week is going to be about Lot delivered from the city of Sodom when God is going right. to rain down fire and brimstone. Twice, twice Lot has to be rescued from terrible circumstances. And if it was because of his desire to be rich, that's why he moved towards Sodom, then moved into Sodom, and indeed he was doing well then this really is a demonstration of what Paul said in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Those who would be rich will pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Lot is a character who's torn. On the one hand, he's a righteous man. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 7 and 8, he vexed his righteous soul over the wickedness in Sodom. He was there in that city and said, this is awful. Well, why are you there? Well, yeah, I know I shouldn't be here, but hey, I'm prospering well. But he keeps losing his wealth. Yeah. He loses it here, and he's going to lose it. At, yeah, I'm giving away 19, but still read it, okay? He's, <laughs> he's going to lose it again. And, and is it there? A, well, we could, we, could, we could give up text talking and go to preaching tonight about, uh, about how when you use ungodly means to get your wealth, somehow the wealth doesn't stick around, does it? And so you have this great contrast, I think, between Abraham and Lot. Abraham's willing to do right and embrace the right kind of people and let God make him rich if that's what he yeah, wants. Let the wealth go. Yes. In that case, and that's Abraham exactly. wasn't going to take the dirty money that came from the, the king of Sodom. Yep. And it uh, looks like Lot was kind of going after that. Anyway. Interesting. All right, we've got to go on to 15 because we do have four more chapters to go. Go. Uh, 15 uh, is about an appearance that God makes to Abraham. Uh, this first verse, if you look at Genesis 15, 1, this first verse is interesting. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And so part of me, Max, wants to take verse 1 and think that he's looking backward, right? on what Abraham has just done and rejected the wealth of Sodom. And God says, I'm going to take care of you. But then you get into 15, and you see these concerns that Abraham has related to the promises, and you wonder also, is God maybe looking forward here and saying, I want you to know I'm going to take care of you in the promises that I've made. Yeah, and of course, Abraham is thinking, you know, I don't have that son yet, and so maybe Eliezer uh, 
one born in my house, a servant. Maybe, maybe there's my heir. So, so you understand the child drama, right? Abraham is a man of faith, but on the other side of faith is the calendar, right? Time is going by, and we're not like, we're not like six weeks past the promise, okay? His, his clock is running out. Yeah. I'm not going there with you, okay? <laughs> um, time is going by, and they are getting older, and I'm not going to say anything else about that either. And so, here in 15, God appears, and evidently one of His purposes is to reassure him about that. You're right. They're wondering about Eliezer. Uh, evidently, at that time, if you died without an heir, your wealth, and I guess maybe they assumed in this case the promise, would have had to go through Eliezer, one of the servants in his yeah. house. And so, what God does is, if you look down at, uh, at verse number four, He builds on the, what's in essence part of the nation promise, promises about the child, and say, no, the child will be born of your body. So this is going to, this child is going to come from you. And then he goes on in five and he repeats the nation promise there. He said, look at the heavens. Uh, your family is going to be like the stars of heaven. And then verse six tells us that Abraham believed him. He believed in the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. And I did some work on this this week because Abraham already believed in God. And so it's not believing in, the, in God in the sense of God's existence. But when it says believed in the Lord, it's the idea of believing that what God promised would come to pass. He had confidence in what the Lord said. Um, there was an action in the mind of Abraham at this point that caused him to have an expectation that what God said would happen would indeed happen. Yep. And it's this kind of trust, David, that leads men to obedience to God. And included in this is trusting in God's power, uh, God's purposes, God's providence, God's promises. Uh, it's like uh, Paul said in uh, Romans 4.21 that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. And that's the idea. Well, pressing on, we also get a good deal of information beginning at verse 7 about the land promise. Now, let me pause. Are you seeing the promise go through? Those, we talked about that at the beginning. The episodes are chosen based on advancing the story. So, we keep hearing about the promise. In verse 7, it's the land promise. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this land and you're going to possess it. And Abraham's question in verse 8 is, O oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? And that leads to that great demonstration that really d dominates the activity of the yeah, end of chapter Yeah, uh, this 15. is where the, the animals are killed. Abraham lays them out, uh, divides the animals, and uh, the fire and the smoking pot move down through the center of that. This incident is really unusual to us. I think, I think a couple of weeks ago you commented on this, but this, while it's unusual to us, this is actually quite common in ancient times. This is what was known as a suzerain treaty, and it typically involved a greater king and a lesser king. The word suzerain may be from the same word as sovereign, one who is sovereign who is over another. But both kings typically would make promises one to another, and then the greater king would say, I'm going to protect you and provide something for you. The lesser king would say, okay, I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to honor whatever it is that you say. And in this case, God is the greater, Abraham is the lesser. And the power of the treaty is in the passing between the animals. And I think you pointed out a, a couple of weeks ago that in essence it says, if I break this treaty, may what has happened to these animals happen, happen to, to me. me. And so, this was God's way of confirming His promise to Abraham. And if we watch carefully in the book of Genesis, as these promises develop over a period of time, what we see is that this was part of a series of confirmations that God made to Abraham that he would keep his promise. And so, what we see here is kind of like a football game. What is it that moves the ball forward? With each of these things, we see the advancement of God's promises, the fulfillment of these things taking place. And as part of that, as all this demonstration is going on, we are given a lot more information about this land promise, wow. particularly as it pertains to time. Did y'all notice that? Picking up around verse 13, uh, your, your descendants are going to be sojourners in Canaan or, or in Egypt and enslaved and oppressed. So, there's a reference to the bondage. Uh, 
And then verse 14, God says, I'm going to judge them and bring them out with great possession. So we have this allusion to the, to the exodus uh, that would eventually come and the Egyptians giving them possessions. Well, why didn't God just give them the land right now? Well, we're getting to that. Hold that thought because uh, in verse 15, he talks about how Abraham will not see any of this. He's going to die before these promises come to pass. And the wickedness of the Amorite who's in the land today is not yet full. And again, there's a lot that can be said about all that because it shows God's justice even when dealing with the disobedient. Yeah, it's important to remember that all land on the earth belongs to God, and yet God does not capriciously just take land from one man and give it to another. God doesn't do that. God is fair. Well, and so what that tells us is, is that when Israel eventually leaves Egypt and goes and conquered Canaan, it's not a land grab. Right. What God is doing is He's using Israel like he would use Assyria later, as the sword of his anger, as the instrument of his wrath to go and punish the, the, the Canaanites. For it was their a judgment on the Canaanites. That's exactly right. What makes it even more interesting is to remember when was Genesis written? <laughs> oh, we talked about this. Genesis was written during the Exodus. And so as now they're going back and getting all this history, it's at the time where they're going to be the instrument of God's wrath. You're not going into this land because you're particularly wonderful people. I promised your forefather Abraham that I was going to use you as an instrument of my wrath to punish the Canaanites for their evil. And so that's what God's doing here. So we learn a lot more about the land promise. Okay. All right. 16. Let's press on to that. Um, this is the Hagar chapter. <laughs> and it's more child drama, right? I told you the stories, the episodes that are recorded are not random. They all pertain to this bigger picture. And so uh, more time has gone by and they still don't have an heir, although they know that the heir has to come from Abraham because God promised that. It's got to come from your body. That was back in 15. So in 16, Abraham and Sarah have this thing figured out. They've decided that what they need to do is to give Sarah's servant, Hagar, to be Abraham's wife. And maybe the plan is, though God didn't tell him this, maybe the plan is that he'll have a child with Hagar and that will be the heir. And that works out wonderfully. Yeah. Until she gets <laughs> pregnant. Yeah. And then uh, multiple problems arise. This... Uh, David, I have to be impressed with how dysfunctional Abraham's family is. Well, Not, the good news is he passed it on to his children, too. Yeah, and uh, because the dysfunction continues, it's Abraham's family is dysfunctional, Isaac's family dysfunctional, Jacob's family dysfunctional. And yet, in spite of all the problems, the domestic issues, God still uses this family. Well, remember before we're too hard on Abraham? Because you look at chapter 15 and it says, he believed God. How can he, how can he be doubting and, and coming up with this alternate plan here at 16? Time is going by, folks. Uh, we learn in chapter 16 and verse 1 that he is, um, I'm sorry, verse 16 rather. Chapter 16, verse 16, that he's 86 when Ishmael is born, okay? He was 75 when he left Haran, Right? So years and years, a decade has gone by now, Max, since the promises were made, and he still doesn't have an heir. And he's 85 years old when they come up with this plot for figuring out how to have a child. So I think the explanation is, the reason for the, let's call it what it is, the doubt, is time is going by. And what God has promised increasingly seems impossible. And so I think they start looking for other alternatives. And of course, when you step outside of God's plan, how does that work out? How often? Always. And so this winds up being a big mess that God has to, it's not the first time he's had to do it either. God's had to step in and fix this mess for him. So we do have the introduction of a new character though with Ishmael. Well, that's right. And uh, the child that is born to Hagar is Ishmael. And uh, boy, there's just, just one issue after another in this chapter with that family. And, and uh, uh, Sarah and Abraham, they get in an argument over this evidently. And she says, you know, God's going to judge this. And God's going to show you that you're the one at fault in this thing. And it may be 
that Abraham could have corrected some of this early in the game, but he didn't. Who knows? But Hagar, she decides that she's going to run away because Abraham says, hey, she's your servant. Do whatever you want with her. And Hagar decides she's going to run away. Well, an angel of the Lord speaks to Hagar and says, look, you need to go back, and uh, God is going to bless you with his son Ishmael. He's going to have 12 tribes, just like it turns out for Israel, there are 12 tribes. And it's the Arab nations that came from Ishmael. And much of the Middle East today is populated by the descendants of Ishmael. And if you stop and think, the angel of the Lord said that his hand, the hand of Ishmael, will be against every man. And that seems to be continuing even today. Constant problems with the descendants of Ishmael. All right, let's press on to 17 because we're running out of time. 17. You, you didn't want to talk about the polygamy? Polygamy never turns out good. That's, that's all I, we need to yeah, say. Go I on to 17. I think that's right. <laughs> Somebody submit a question about polygamy. We'll talk about that. Uh, chapter 17, three things. You have a rehearsal of the promises again, this time a focus on the nation promise, mm -hmm. and then the covenant of circumcision, and then more child drama. So those same themes that we've been reading about just come up again and again. I think it's interesting to parallel chapters 15 and 17, because in both cases you have an appearance of God and in both cases, the promises are expounded on. We get more information. In the case of 15, there's more about the land promise. So we learned about the whole Egyptian piece of that. And then in 17, we learn more about the child and the nation. That promise is expanded for on in both chapters. In 15, uh, God does something for Abraham, that demonstration. And then in 17, he's going to ask Abraham to do something for him. So the chapters really kind of parallel each other. It's very, very interesting that way. So uh, in, in, you notice in 17 and 1, how old is Abraham now? 99. So more time is going by, and, and you can tell uh, just more and more doubt from him. Uh, about how is it ever going to be possible that I'm going to be able to have a child? Well, David, when we pray, we ask God, God, I need this, or I've got to have that, or whatever. And if God doesn't do it by Tuesday, we say, well, God's evidently not going to do anything. <laughs> Look, 24 years have passed since God first made this promise to Abraham that all these things would come about. 24 years. I think it just shows us that uh, time is no factor with God. God's going to do what He wants to do in His time. And even men of great faith sometimes struggle in their faith. Verse 17, Abraham says, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And he should have stopped there, but he went on to say, And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? It just didn't seem possible. We should probably note also that that verse says that he fell on his face and laughed. It just didn't seem possible. So what we have in 17 is a renewal of that child promise and an expounding on it, just like we had in 15 with the land promise, more detail. So if you look at verse 19, I'm going to give you a son, and the added information is by Sarah. So I will come from Sarah. I'm told what his name will be. His name will be Isaac. This will be the child with whom I will establish my covenant. But I think verse 21 gives the most important piece of information. Because in verse 21, we learn one year and the child is going to be born. By this time next year, you're going to have the child. Yeah, and the fact that God is going to establish his covenant with him. Yes. And uh, uh, all of this is moving the ball forward, uh, advancing the story. And so then you have the institution of the covenant of circumcision, mm -hmm. uh, which will be part of the nation for the rest of their history. I just thought it was a remarkable testimony to Abraham's faith, if he, if he rebounds a little bit here, that after getting the instruction, verse 23 says, the very same day they went out and did it. Well, if there were, there were time to kind of pause and take a moment, that would have been it. But they didn't. They obeyed God that very day. Yeah, and all these servants had to be circumcised, yes. these 318 or however many there were at this yeah. point. I think it's also interesting that God names the child Isaac, and Isaac means laughter. And... Uh, I think that's interesting. Both Abraham and Sarah laugh uh, in this incident. 
Well, that brings us to 18, doesn't it? It because does. Because that's where Sarah laughs. Now, let me tell you, tonight we're only going to deal with the first 15 verses because picking up at verse 16, this visit, and that's what chapter 18 is about, the visit from these three visitors, we'll call them at this point, uh, that's what chapter 18 deals with. But in the first half, it's all about the child. Picking up at verse 16, all their attention turns to Sodom, and then that story continues on through 19. So we want to stop at 15 tonight, and we'll sort of group the whole Sodom story together in our next text talk. So let's come back uh, to the beginning of 15, where these three visitors arrive to rehearse again the child promise. And of course, Max, the question becomes, who are the visitors? It's... uh, an interesting collection of individuals. Well, it looks like to me a couple of these go on to Sodom, and they're going to try to find uh, uh, ten righteous men. But yes. the other one, uh, the other one, stays and talks with Abraham for a while, and it's very clear that it's the angel of the Lord. He's represented as the Lord Himself. I'm persuaded that the angel of the Lord is a special representative of God who speaks in the first person for God. That's my understanding. Well. We know the other two are angels because chapter 19, verse 1, we haven't read that yet. It tells us that two angels yeah. come to Sodom. The question is about this other one who uh, is referred to over and over again as the Lord yeah. in his interactions with Abraham. So let's go back in and pick up with the news that they bring about the child because verse 12 says that uh, when they bring the news about the child, this time it's not Abraham, but it's Sarah. Uh, who laughs, and and some believe kind of gets scolded here about that, which prompted the question that we got for text talk tonight. And that, and I'm going to pitch this over to you. Um, why did Abraham get a pass on his laughter, but Sarah gets in trouble? That hardly seems fair. Well, you know, she denies that she laughed. Uh, that's a strange thing. Uh, which again, as though God wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we shouldn't be too hard on her because sometimes we act like he doesn't know either. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I just think it's interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting what she said. She said, and after she left, she said, after I have grown old, shall I have, my pl- shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And so she sees the idea that bringing a child into the world is going to be a wonderful thing. It's going to be, and it would be something that would bring joy. And She might laugh. Maybe her laughter express doubt, whereas Abraham's laughter might have just been joy. I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. You know, I went back and read those two passages, and I have to tell you, I am not sure, other than the correction, uh, no, you really did laugh, I don't really see an admonition here. That's where I am, too. And so when I read it, I just thought, "Mm, if she gets fussed at it, isn't very much. And the other part I'd add to that is, remember, the, the, the outlying factor in all of this is God always knows the hearts, and we don't. We can look at outward behaviors. We don't know what drives it inwardly. So if you want to conclude that she was in a little bit more trouble than Abraham, I guess it had something to do with the heart. I just don't see that that was the case here. Well, the point is the story is moving forward. Sarah is going to bear a child and within a year. 90. Within a year. We're close. Yeah, by this time next year. Okay, so does that make y'all want to continue on now? Because we're almost there, almost time for the birth of the child. That's coming up over the next couple of weeks in the reading. But we've got to get through Sodom and Gomorrah first. Sodom and Gomorrah come next. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've emphasized a couple of times tonight how dysfunctional and disorderly the family of Abraham was. Look at all this mess. It's just one problem after another, it seems to be. But in the midst of all this, we need to be mindful that God is working out a plan to bring a Savior into the world. This isn't just about the birth of Isaac. It's about Isaac and then Jacob and then the 12 tribes. And from these 12 tribes is going to come a Savior into the world. God is looking long term. You know, we're we're so short-sighted in the way we plan and do things. God is planning 2,000 years in the future because from the time the promises were made to Abraham, Until the time the Messiah Jesus was born, it was two millennia, 2,000 years. From our perspective, we look back and we say 2,000 years ago the Savior came. Uh, He came into the world. He lived. He taught. He worked His miracles to confirm His deity. 
He died on a cross, was buried, and was raised the dead, from the dead the third day, raised for our justification. Ultimately, this wasn't just something that would benefit Abraham. It wasn't just something that would benefit his family. But as he said, as God told him in Genesis 12, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that includes us. We today, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse tw number 29, we can become heirs of the promises made to Abraham. You and I, when we're baptized into Christ, we're part of the Bible story because we then are linked into Abraham as part of the heirs of the promise. What a blessing that is. And Galatians 3 says we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Neither Jew nor Gentile, doesn't matter. We're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And maybe there's someone here tonight that says, I've not yet been baptized into Christ. This is your time, your opportunity right here and now to be baptized into Christ. If you're ready to begin to serve the Lord Jesus, why don't you respond? Come now as we stand and as we sing.